This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we continue in the book of Daniel. But before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we're controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and everything that you have provided so that we might study your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds would be open and receptive to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. In our last lesson, we began to look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 9 and following. From the standpoint of the future Antichrist. In other words, we're interpreting it in light of the Antitype, who is the Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is a small horn. He's the one who expands his rule at first towards the south, towards the east, and the beautiful land. So he is our subject, the small horn Antichrist. We'll be looking at him, his character, his methods from a number of scriptures today. He begins the great persecution of all believers at the middle of the tribulation. He will take control of the temple, seat himself in the holy place, and place an image of himself there. The false prophet at his side will demand that the world worship him. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 again. And it, referring to the small horn, made himself as great as the prince of the army from whom the daily sacrifice was removed and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. The army was given over to the horn along with the daily sacrifice and the time of the rebellion. The horn threw the truth to the ground and did what it did and prospered. Well, let's begin to look at some of the points here one at a time. We got through one and two last time. This time we will continue on with more points from other verses. First of all, he made himself great as the prince of the army. As Satan himself attempted to promote himself to the level of God, so will Satan's Antichrist. As Satan seeks to replace God, his Antichrist will seek to replace the Christ, the prince of the army, that is, of believers. Number two, the daily sacrifice is removed and the place of sanctuary was thrown down. He seats himself in the temple of God, places his image in a prominent place, and the false prophet calls for the world to worship him. The false prophet will demand that all his followers take his mark of the beast or suffer the consequences. The Antichrist, the false prophet, will control a one-world religion that will demand total allegiance to the Antichrist, which in turn leads to the worship of Satan. Now, the Antichrist is Satan's counterfeit Christ. Satan takes on the role as God as he places his Antichrist on the throne in Jerusalem and tries to establish his own kingdom on earth, a counterfeit kingdom of the kingdom of God. With the false prophet and the Antichrist, Satan has his unholy trinity. Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. Now this may sound astounding as we think about it, to think that the whole world would come under the grips of Satan's world system. But the scripture already tells us that it started. And as you grow spiritually and gain more discernment, it will become very clear that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.7 And that Satan does have the world in his grips and only growing Christians can avoid that. Now the world is going to worship the beast, the Antichrist, even more so after an event that happens, as we will see described now in Revelation 13.3. 
because at some point the Antichrist is going to receive a near fatal wound and have a miraculous recovery. Revelation 13, 3 and 4. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Now this is John the Apostle's description of what the world sees. It'll appear to be a fatal wound. And people say, well, he's going to die. But then it gets healed. And that startles the world because he was expected to die. And this even further enhances, promotes um, the following of him. People will be so astounded. They will say, he is somebody very special. Verse 4, man worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. Notice, the dragon is Satan. So as I said earlier, people in turn worship the devil through the beast. And they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Who can challenge him? No one is like him upon the earth. Revelation 13, 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. In verse 12, the army was given over to the horn. We'll just continue on as we look at verse 12. Let's put that up there. This brings up our third point. The army was given over to the horn. The army is the cadre of Christians that's on earth who are being pursued and persecuted by Satan. If he cannot get a hold of Christians, he will try to control everything and everyone around them to make life very difficult. He will have this reign as the Lord will allow him to do this, both the testing of Christians at the same time the Antichrist will think he has control. Revelation 13, 15 through 17 gives us additional information on this. He, the false prophet, this is the Antichrist uh, co-worker, you might say, his uh, sidekick in a sense, but he, false prophet, was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Now this is a major event. This image will basically seem to come to life. Somehow it is animated and it can speak. Verse 16 he also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. In the last 15, 20 years or so, it has become the thing to get tattoos. People will be proud to wear their mark of the beast, as they are so many of their tattoos. And the time of the rebellion, this is when this isn't going to occur. This is our fourth point. This will take place during the final seven years of the 490 that we studied in Daniel, the seven years of tribulation. This is the final period, the appointed time, the time of wrath or indignation. Within this seven-year period, there will be a great rebellion against anything of the true God. Many will fall away from the faith, even Christians, and join in with the Antichrist, thinking he is the Christ. This is where baby believers, um, 
believers are ignorant of the Word of God, quite blunt but quite true, they don't know the Word of God. They may be religious, they may uh, attend churches, but they do not study the Word of God to seriously develop discernment and know any better. They will go with the herd. Many will fall away from the faith. Paul and the Lord Jesus both warned of this time. The words of Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2.3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day of the Lord will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Here we see a description of the timetable that Paul gives us. The Lord will not return until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The word for rebellion, by the way, let me show it to you. You'll recognize it. Apostasia. Of course, we get the word apostasy from it. It means defection or falling away. Now, Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Now this is not only a falling away from the faith, but there is also betrayal and hate. This runs very deep. People will resent Christians. You didn't come over to my side when I left your brand of Christianity. I really like this guy. I think he must be the Christ. This is what I understand Christ to be in my mind. And you didn't follow and you are now becoming my enemy. That will be the thinking of many who turn away from Christ. And they will wear that mark proudly. They'll be glad to turn in believers who dare not follow their false Messiah. Mark 13, 12. Brother will betray brother to death. We're talking about the closest relatives. And a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put the children of faithful Christians who decided to go their own way. In this case, they end up going the way of the Antichrist, will contribute to having their parents executed. Our next line in verse 12. The horn threw the truth to the ground and did what it did and prospered. Let's look at the horn through the truth to the ground. The Antichrist and his regime will oppose anything of truth, Bible truth, anything of God or Christ of Christianity, genuine Christianity, any possession of the scripture in any form, paper, electronic, will be strictly forbidden and receive the most severe punishment. Add to this any speech that would any way, in any way, oppose the unholy trinity. The final phrase, and did what he did and prospered. Nothing will stop the success of the Antichrist. Once he has gotten the world where he wants it, he will receive tremendous adoration and approval, so much so that people will want the mark of the beast on their bodies. You can just see them display them proudly, some on their foreheads and others on their forearms along their wrist area perhaps, but it will be obvious that is their mark. No doubt this will bring incredible demands on the faith of believers wherever they are. 
the Apostle John writes and gives warning in the book of Revelation 13, 9, he who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Well, this is clear that some believers will be taken captive. Others will be executed. I haven't given a lot of thought why some are captive and taken captive and others are executed, but as we know from history, they have their purposes to take some captives, captive. If they can take leaders and turn them, that would be a great accomplishment for the Antichrist and his forces. On the other hand, those who would never turn, who are not uh, uh, very well known or powerful, they would just get them out of the way. They have no useful purpose in discussing these last days. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. So it's critical that one maintain his faith and trust in God, not to deny our Lord or take the mark of the beast. It has eternal consequences. Second Timothy 2, 12 and 13. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. We're not talking about depriving reward here. This is disowning. You see the word? If we are faithless, he will be faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God will never be unfaithful towards us. We make the first move. We decide to disown God through deny Christ or to lose our faith, God's still there, God's still faithful. He always upholds his end. Finally, the last point from verse 12. He did what he did and prospered. The Antichrist will be extremely successful in most everything he does. He will have problem areas, but he will deal with them. Uh, in an overall sense, he is extremely successful. His rapid rise to power, his control of the world's economy, his military conquests, uh, his gaining control of major regions of the earth. People will look to him to see what he decides, what he's going to do. And he will receive the adoration and worship of the world. And he will be very successful in his persecution of the Christians. In Daniel 8.13, we turn to see what the angels said about this time period. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 together. Then I heard a holy one referring to the angel speaking. Another holy one, an angel said to the one who was speaking. How long will the vision take place? The one about the daily sacrifice and the rebellion that causes destruction with the giving over of the sanctuary and army being trampled. So the question by this angel to the other angel, he sort of sums up some of the things said about this period. His question is, how long will it happen? The answer, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. For 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, as you recall, the first time we went through this with the type, this refers to the sacrifices that have been taken out. 
they were two daily, one in the evening, one in the morning. This amounts, this amounts to 1150 days. The period of 1150 days will be the time starting about with the raising of the image of the Antichrist till it's coming down toward the end of the tribulation. So there will be an end to it. Now in verses 15 to 23, uh, this basically is what we've read before and studied in detail. It doesn't really describe anything about the Antichrist, so we're just going to read through it and then come back to the subject of the Antichrist. This is Daniel 8, 15 through 23. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought understanding, and behold, standing before me was one who appeared like a mighty man. Then I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Uli called out, Gabriel, enable this person to understand the vision. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. Then he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. That's an important phrase. Time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I fell into a deep sleep and my face to the ground. Then he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will happen at the final period of the indignation. Another important phrase. For it pertains to the appointed time of the end. There we are, there we are again. And notice, verse 17 has time of the end. Verse 19 has time in the end, <clears throat> and it's called the final period of the indignation. That's the seven-year tribulation period. And then he goes into the background of what happens, as we saw with uh, the background of Antiochus. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. It's a direct interpretation. Not any question on that. The male goat, the buck, is the king of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now what you might obviously observe here is that this helps us not get confused about the interpretation. Uh, Daniel writes this in a way that we understand. Now he's talking about the historical fulfillment. All right, He's not talking about the anti-type. He's talking about the type being set up who becomes uh, uh, Antiochus IV, who becomes the type. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms that will rise from his nation but not have his power. Toward the end of their reign as kings. Now we're moving back into the type, anti-type analogy. All right? That's the transition now. We're back into the talking about the person himself. Now, that means the king's interpretation is going to change also. Now we're projected forward into the future in verse 23. So the kings are referring to, let me go ahead and finish this, as kings when these transgressors are at their limits, a stern-faced king will arise who understands intrigue. So in the historical interpretation these kings I'm going to put it back up there these kings are referring to the kings who are in power when the Antichrist takes over. The kings will be coming to their end. This is the kings of Rome too. When their transgression, transgressors are at their limits, their time is just about up. That's a way of putting it. The Antichrist will rise to the top and begin to consolidate his rule. And then we're, giving, we're given uh, one of the first characteristics of the Antichrist. When it says, a stern-faced king will arise. Let's talk about that. I'm going to put this on the board. I think it'll work out that way. Characteristics of 
the Antichrist. Number one, he is strong-willed. Coming from the phrase, a stern-faced king will arise. The Antichrist will be strong-willed, insolent, and flexible, unmoved in the way he self-righteously projects himself. He will be stern in his look. His followers will see this as determination to do the right thing. I mean, he's doing it for them. So it's an admirable trait. The hard face look is for their cause. Probably similar to what uh, attitude was towards uh, someone like Hitler. What he looked like when he gave his ranting speeches. They're just in their minds and hearts going, yeah, yeah. Then they give the sea high. The second point we see is he is a master, a master manipulator who understands intrigue. This tells us that he knows he's an expert at making plans behind people's back, making secret plans, working them out. He's a master schemer, a master manipulator using deceit and intrigue, a master politician. We continue more characteristics in verse 24. He uses supernatural power. His power will be great, but it will not be by his strength alone. He will cause extraordinary destruction and will succeed in what he does. He will destroy powerful people and the holy people, literally people of the holy ones. So from this first line, we see, thirdly, he uses supernatural power. Remember that the Antichrist is backed by, or we could say, Satan works through the Antichrist. He has his miraculous power to use. Satan is supernatural, beyond what we as humans can do by far. So what he does is by supernatural power that will convincingly mislead many people. Paul describes the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. And ten. That is the one Antichrist whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. I want you to notice this first line, or actually the first verse here we're looking at. Satan will use all power. People will see him as all-powerful. And the Antichrist will have that power at hand. With that power, he'll produce signs and wonders that are false. Signs and wonders is a big movement in our day. Um, false signs and wonders is a movement in Satan's day when his Antichrist will come to the front. So those who are seeking signs and wonders, they'll have plenty of that as soon as the Antichrist comes to the front. Notice, with all the deception of wickedness, this deception is all intended for evil. The Antichrist is very good at misleading people. These miracles, false signs and wonders, are a tool of false teachers today. So they will be a tool for the Antichrist in the future. He will fool people in convincing the people he is the Christ and the one to follow. False teachers, false prophets, uh, 
many of the false movements, the charismatic movement, is used by the devil today to move people into false teaching and keep them in neutral in their service to God. It's on large scale and it's worldwide. It will be much more when Satan comes to the front. But as we know today, uh, people are being prepared for that. Unfortunately, many Christians have fallen into the trap already. Those who want signs and wonders will hear and see plenty of them from the two beasts the Antichrist, and the false prophet during the tribulation. The tribulation will be a uh, period when there's a lot of signs and wonders. Uh, some will be from God through the prophets Moses and Elijah, and uh, certainly from God as they see the world judged. <clears throat> Let's just write that down. That's what we're talking about for a moment. Uh, let's write signs wonders, miracles. There will be a period of signs and wonders and miracles that will come from both sides. Just as you saw Moses uh, uh, confront the false magicians, or I should say magicians, uh, of Pharaoh. So there will be a battle going on in the supernatural world and will manifest itself in signs and wonders and miracles. Satan will have his uh, performers, you might say, and God will have his leaders. And perhaps even the 144,000 will get on, on this. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't think it's actually mentioned in Scripture, but for them to go worldwide as evangelists, in an intense period like it will be, it wouldn't surprise me if they too had the ability to do this just like the apostles. So signs, wonders, and miracles will be very active during the period of the tribulation. Both false ones and true ones. Okay, back to verse 24. Daniel 8.24, where we see the next trait. He will cause extraordinary destruction and will succeed in what he does. So the fourth point, he's very destructive. He will cause extraordinary destruction and will succeed in what he does. The Antichrist will lead uh, the destructive forces of the first of four horsemen in Revelation 6. With his forces, he will bring wars and conquer his opposition to where he can gather his powers to gain rule of the world. By the end of the fourth horseman, some one quarter of the world equal to a quadrant of the earth's surface will have been affected by these devastating acts of the four horsemen. No doubt millions of people, if not billions, will, by day, will be directly affected as Satan leads the destructive forces behind the wars, the revolutions, the famine, and disease. As much as one or more continents on planet Earth could be taken out of the picture early in the tribulation. People will be dying at super alarming rates as a result of Satan's wreaking havoc on the world, lining things up for his worship and rule. But he also specifically goes after believers. Point five, he will destroy his opposition. He will destroy powerful people and the holy people. The Antichrist will have power that we have never seen 
He will have power like we have never seen in the modern history. He will take down some of the most powerful leaders in the world. The holy people here are believers. He will also be out to destroy all leading and outspoken Christians, all faithful believers. This is the one group, group he must get rid of. This is the remnant he seeks to destroy, to wipe out faith on the earth. Through controlling the world's economy and with a major with major military forces under his command. He will destroy anyone who gets in his way. He will rapidly consolidate his rule. He will move so fast, he will make Alexander the Great look slow. Once the Great Tribulation begins at the middle of the seven-year period, obviously any believer who does not take the mark, will find himself out of the normal routine of life dramatically. The world will turn on the Jewish and Gentile believers worldwide like never before. At the same time, it will turn against all Jews, believers or unbelievers. And through, with the aid of his demons, now confined to the earth, the heat will be turned on at its highest level against those of faith, mentioned here as the holy people. Finally, we see he prospers through deceit. Verse 25, that's point six, he prospers through deceit. And through his treachery, he will prosper through deceit. Let's read through the verse. He will have an arrogant attitude. He will destroy many who are at ease, that is, unaware of the danger. He will even stand up against the prince of princes, but without any human agency, he will be broken. Here we see a few other characteristics about the Antichrist. First of all, and through his treachery, he will prosper through deceit. The Antichrist is a master of deceit. Like Antiochus and more, he will use what he wants to gain his way and he will be successful. Many will see that he cannot do wrong. And if he does something outlandish, they will view it as justifiable. Another point here, he will have an arrogant attitude. This should remind us of what we saw with Nebuchadnezzar. Builds a huge statue and demands worship. The Antichrist, along with the false prophet, will do the same thing with his image. He will claim things about himself that are total lies. But you see, remember, the mystery of lawlessness will be at its height at this time, and people will believe it. It's like he can't do anything wrong. He can't say anything wrong. And that's why they worship him. Just as Antiochus was so proud and held a high opinion of himself, the Antichrist much more so. We see here that he will destroy many who are at ease. That's a phrase we see in the middle of verse 25. It means he's going to catch many people who are living in their comfort zones, think they've got it made, but what this also means is many will have no sense of what is going on. They will not see themselves as being pawns they will find themselves comfortable and secure, thinking peace and safety. That's the Old Testament line of false prophets, by the way. Then they are blindsided. The next thing we see, point eight, 
he will directly oppose Jesus Christ. He will even stand up against the prince of princes, as the scripture says. He gathers the world's armies, reinforced by his demonic army, to oppose and do battle with Christ. And then the final characteristic, the one I like, he will come to his end. He will come to his end. And this is described in an interesting way because it says, but without any human agency. In other words, no human is going to bring the Antichrist down. despite all these movies where people have their armies against him. That's just nonsense. Only Christ can bring him down, and that's who Christ, and that's who will do it. It says he will be broken. The nephel and perfect of the word shabar. It's a word used for breaking a piece of clay pottery. He is crushed he is destroyed. Do you remember back in Daniel 7, 26, when Daniel was having his vision in heaven and he saw the court convened? Let me bring that verse back up here. But the court will convene and his dominion will be taken away, destroyed, and abolished forever. Now this is interesting. Note that Daniel doesn't use the word die or killed. He doesn't use it, uh, that is in our verse I'm, re I'm, I'm referring to. He says he's broken in pieces. He's broken, basically. He will be broken. Look at verse 25 again. At the end of the verse, he will be broken doesn't use the word killed or even the word destroyed or something along that line that would mean he was killed but he's described as being broken now this may be because if he's part angel he can't be killed there's also more evidence of him being part angel because he's not judged like human beings are. He's actually tossed directly into the lake of fire. Revelation 19.20 There's no last judgment for him. Listen to Revelation 19.20 and 21. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. By the way, that's eventually what will happen to the devil also. The rest of them were killed with the sword, they came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on the flesh. Notice, everybody else, except these two, are killed. Angels can't be killed, and apparently neither can half angels. So they are imprisoned into the abyss, or for their final destiny later on, the lake of fire. That's what happens with angels, fallen angels. In verse 26, the vision comes to an end. The vision of the evenings and mornings which had been told is true. Notice how he refers to it as evenings and mornings, which again relates to the sacrifice of evenings and mornings, and I think further confirms that this uh, 2300 Evenings and mornings is cut in half to refer to 1150 days. But you seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. 
This vision of evenings and mornings refers to the vision we just saw interpreted in this chapter. What it said about Antiochus, and then later, it'll apply to Antiochus, uh, to the Antichrist. There are to be no doubts about this, however difficult the information was to hear. It is still true, the word of God, in fact. The fulfillment of these prophecies about Antiochus was still over 350 years from Daniel's day. The fulfillment of the prophecies about the Antichrist is still in our future. He says, but you seal up the vision. You is in the Hebrew here. For emphasis, you don't always see the personal pronoun, but in this case we do. We see the term seal up, the cal imperative of satham. It means to shut up or conceal. It's also used in Daniel 12, verses 4 and 9, where this is said about the prophecies of this book. And then he adds this last phrase, for it refers to many days from now. Let me just put that up there at the end of the verse. Now, this helps explain what needs to be sealed up. Let's talk about that for a few moments. This information that Daniel has given us in this book, and this is the most serious information for us as Christians. This is important for the future, both for the Antiochus fourth Epiphanes generation and that of the Antichrist generation. This information is to be sealed, preserved for them. Now for the latter group, much more information is coming in the form of revelation. God will give those of the generation of the Antichrist a lot more information. Jesus himself gave it to us. And certainly Paul and John the Apostle. This tells us that these prophecies are not for public consumption. This is something that's reserved. Something that's so important is to be kept and held for those two future generations. It's important for us now as we approach those final years. The application for believers regarding Antiochus has already been fulfilled, but for the Antichrist generation, for us now, because Rome too could form up soon and the Antichrist would be right behind. The groundwork for that is already laid. Nations are in place. We're just waiting to see the power shifts take place, which the way the world is today, it is certainly ready for something like that. Pretty soon people will be so concerned about their own security, about their own safety, they will give up some part of their nation's sovereignty. Now listen, for us to read what Daniel predicted, what would happen in the future with Antiochus, let me just write that down, something to look at. For what Daniel wrote and predicted about what would happen with Antiochus, and it has been fulfilled He also writes about the Antichrist. And we can expect that it too, in detail, will be fulfilled. Right now, we are to get ready. We are to be on the alert. And we can be confident that these things will happen. At the same time, all those warnings and all those truths that Jesus and Paul and others gave us. We take them to heart and we take them seriously and we learn these things 
as if it is the most serious information we can learn. Folks, it will happen. And I can tag on the end of that, on the end of that, from the way things look now, it will happen soon. Verse 27, our last verse. Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up and went in and went about the king's business. But I was astonished at the vision, and there was no way to explain it. This experience of this vision, interpretation, going around here with these angels and having to get this through his mind and in his heart and learn it and then write it. Later on, this experience took a lot out of Daniel physically, mentally, emotionally. He was exhausted. Now, we get it chunks at a time. And that is even exhausting to study these things and get them out there for people to sit and listen and concentrate for a length of time. Daniel had to do this for some period of time. A spiritual burden is tough, even for old veterans like Daniel. We see here it took him days to recover. He's older now, remember that. And when he did, after he got his rest, he got up and went back to work. He's still working for the king, by the way this point when he got this vision let's look at the last line but I was astounded at the vision and there was no way to explain it this vision made such a lasting impression on Daniel first of all it had been hard to explain to anybody who had the frame of reference for it who would understand it and then the question is how could this happen well this is basically the end of human history as we know it now because we're talking about the period right up to the millennium the thousand year reign of Christ we're talking about that intense period of seven years of tribulation that will occur in the future. How do you explain these things, especially back in the day of Daniel? They hadn't even got to, the, they hadn't even got to Antiochus yet. How do you further explain that to those after Antiochus? Well, God has given us much more revelation. He's given us the New Testament for one thing. He gives us the Holy Spirit, and he gives us some pastor teachers and teachers who will teach these things in depth. They're few and far between, considering the vastness of uh, nominal Christianity. But this is important stuff for us to know. Parents, teach it to your children. Tell your friends about it. Tell your brothers and sisters and relatives and everyone who's a Christian that time is short. So many out there are saying, I'm looking for Christ to come back. That's fine. But before he comes back, we've got a horrible period to go through. And I did say through. I don't anticipate, don't expect, and don't see in Scripture that Christians are going to suffer at the level the world does. We will go through suffering, no doubt about it, but we are also in God's hand, just as you are now. So as you go through those daily trials and tribulations, God is preparing all of us. Perhaps we will live through this period, and some of us, if we live through it, we will see Christ return. Perhaps many will be martyred, others captive, and others may not live to that period. Well, this ends the chapter, and we'll continue on in chapter 9 next time. 
Well, Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this lesson. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you that you have given us through the prophet Daniel what the future holds. At the same time, we know that you got your hold on the future. Father, keep us faithful. Help us stay true to your word and the power of your spirit. Challenge us what we've heard today and help us make those proper applications. In Jesus' name, amen.